So I'm going to talk uh, about something that's slightly about data, slightly um, about uh, programming, slightly about social engineering. Uh, so, um, start off, many of you may not know what a WordNet is, so introduce that, then talk about the multilingual WordNets, the core of this, a uh, little bit about how we can use them with Python, what's new, and where we're planning to go. So, um, my expectation is no one, but who's heard of a WordNet before? Okay, no, you're, that's nice. So WordNet is basically a kind of dictionary um, where it's built as a graph of meanings. So similar words. Um, but so the basic idea is that if I have something like the concept of tiger, then this can be placed in a thing. It's a subtype of big cats, tigers, lions, leopards, and so forth. And it has children. So a Bengal tiger is a tiger, a tiger cub is a tiger, a tigress is a tiger, and so forth. And this concept may be represented in different languages. So here we're showing the WordNet Bahasa, um, which has Malay and Indonesian in it. So tiger itself is in standard Malay, Harimau, or slightly um, colloquially, Pak Belang, Uncle Stripe. Um, in Indonesian, they don't use that very much, but they also have machan, meaning tiger. So we have different words uh, for the same concept, and these may be lexicalized or not lexicalized. So there's really no word for tigress, for example. You just say female tiger. Um, the same even for tiger cub, you say child tiger, and so forth. So languages differ um, in what they link. Um, the, this research was started, in fact, by psychologists, by George Miller, famous for his work on short-term memory, uh, for English. They were, they were trying to find out how we can um, categorize how people organize information in our minds. So when we think of something like a sparrow, we don't necessarily remember everything about sparrow. We say a sparrow is a bird, and birds have these properties, so sparrow will inherit many of the things from bird. Um, and they organized this for about 100,000 words for English. And it was very popular. It was released under an open license, similar to the uh, MIT license. People use it a lot. Uh, and so people started to make WordNets for other languages. The Euro WordNet project, the Balka WordNet project, the Asian WordNet project. Um, when I started, I used to work in Japan in the phone company. Uh, we wanted to have a better dictionary of Japanese, and we thought we'll build a WordNet. And uh, our clever idea was saying, we have many Japanese dictionaries to other languages. We have Japanese to French, we have Japanese to German, we have Japanese to Malay, we have Japanese to uh, Spanish, as it turns out. And if we have WordNets for those languages, we can try and build the WordNet automatically. Because the big problem for automatic processing of language is ambiguity. If I say bat in English, then it could be the sort of baseball bat, could be a cricket bat, or it could be the sort of bat that flies at night catching insects. Um, but if I have access to a dictionary of German, the bat for hitting things will be bat, the bat that flies at night is Fledermaus. Fledermaus, I guess? Flying mouse. Um, uh, the same if I'm using, uh, speaking in French, there'll be different words for the two different bats. In Japanese, different words for the two different bats. So we can map the Japanese komori to the right bat concept. Through English, it's difficult. We don't know which bat to go through. But if we go through German or we go through French, it will work better. So I thought, oh great, there's lots of word nets. I'll go and collect them all and do this. But it turned out that in 2008, we had free word nets for English. We had free word nets for Arabic, uh, funded by the CIA. We had a, a nice word net for Hindi. Um, and that was about it. There were some free as in beer word nets with restrictions on whether you could redistribute them. And there were some very expensive word nets in various countries. So I said, this is silly. Um, we'll make the Japanese one open, at least. 
and uh, we a new project built free WordNets for French, for Polish, for Catalan, um, and I started. Um, I got some grant money from Creative Commons. We said, let's see if we can persuade people to release more WordNets. Um, why should language use be restricted? We freed Spanish. Um, we freed Galician Basque, the other Spanish languages. Um, people in Iran built a WordNet. Um, uh, Scandinavia. We built this, the WordNet. I left Japan and came to NTU, where we built something for Bahasa. Then we built something for Chinese. This was interesting. There were two, in fact, three Chinese WordNets, all not released. As soon as we said, we are going to release our WordNet, one of the others said, we'll release ours now, before you. Um, and that is helping, I think. If you release um, something free, you can push other people to release something for free. And then we merged, because, of course, um, now they're free, we can do that. The same for Bahasa, in fact. We released the WordNet Bahasa, and we got the Indonesian WordNet, the Malay WordNet, everyone cooperated to build one bigger uh, thing. More languages got added, um, many of them very small. So Europe has lots of languages, um, but not many. So the real um, wealth in the world's languages is here in Asia. Uh, Papua New Guinea has more languages per square foot than anywhere in the world, many of them with only 10,000 speakers. Um, and we're currently working with people in the tiny island of Alor, roughly here, um, on the Abui language, a language with 16,000 speakers. Um, and their linguist built a, the first ever dictionary of Abui. It had no written language until then, um, and linked it to English. But most of the Abui people don't want to speak English. They want to look things up in Indonesian. Um, they might want to look th things up in Dutch. They might want to look th things up in other languages. Or they might want to watch K-pop. They might want to re watch Japanese anime. So we said, let's try and link this dictionary not to English, but to the WordNet. And then suddenly you get access to all of the languages uh, in the world. Now, every new WordNet we add makes the, the network that much richer, of course. Um, just in bilingual lexicons, it's proportional to the square. And it makes it easier to add new languages. So if we already have Croatian, it's easier to add Serbian. Um, if we have uh, uh, Indonesian, it's easier to add Mingapao, for example. Similar languages make it easier to do things. Different languages have different phenomena. So English um, doesn't have classifiers, for example, um, whereas Chinese, Malay, Japanese all do. English doesn't care very much about resultative states of verbs, but Czechoslovakian and the Slav Slavic languages do. So as we add more and more languages, we learn more and more about languages. So how did we do it? How did we go from five open word nets to now 35 open word nets and promises from India to add another 20 uh, this year? Um, partly it was leading by example. So we built word nets for Japanese, for Bahasa, for Chinese, and we opened them. Partly it was appeal to self-interests. Most word nets are built by academics. Academics get brownie points if people read their papers. And we did a survey of citation counts versus openness of lexical resources. And it turns out that if you open your lexical resource, more people use it, and therefore more people cite you. So it's directly ties into what academics want. Um, technical things. It turns out we had sort of 30 WordNet projects and 25 different formats. So I spent many happy Sunday afternoons writing converters to a very simple format um, that we can all share. And this won't surprise anyone who's worked with large data sets. Many of them were awful. So they'd have 3,000 um, entries the same, for example, or loops in the hierarchy and so forth. So we, did a, we gave things back. If someone gave us their WordNet, we'd not just add it to the open multilingual WordNet, but say, we have found these problems in your resource. We suggest that you can fix them in this way. Um, we tried to praise people. If people released a WordNet, we make a fuss about it. Um, we try to shame people in private. 
We go to people at conferences and say, we really want to use your WordNet, but it's not open. The license doesn't allow us to. Can't you do something about it? And it works. People um, have roughly half of the WordNets used to be non-free and have now been freed. Um, we showed that it's useful to release it. We have an open website, um, the, the link I gave earlier on, where you can download all of these WordNets. When we put them up, Google slurped them all up for Google Translate. And it turns out that, again, is useful for getting funding if you say you're being used by someone big. Um, you can download in multiple formats. Once we have them, it's easy to convert them. Um, and they're used by other systems. How much time do I have? OK, still some. So how many are Python people in this room? Um, a few. So there are other, other uh, APIs, but this is the one I mainly use. So the Natural Language Toolkit is a very popular toolkit for natural language. It's in the name. Um, and we, some of my students, in fact, um, as a project in a programming course, extended the um, English interface of WordNet to be multilingual. So now you can import NLTK, import the WordNet, tell me how many things can dog mean in English. It turns out quite a lot. So there's the animal, there's um, an ugly person, there's a sm can't remember what the third one is. There's um, a nasty guy. There's a frankfurter, like a hot dog. Um, there's the hook on a ratchet that stops it moving round. There's something for poking a fire. And there's the verb to dog someone. If we look at the first one, we have definitions for all of these. Um, and then we can say, show me how this is expressed in other languages. So if we look up in Japanese, it's inu or dogu or yoken or so forth. We look it up in standard Malay, it's anjing, um, so forth. And WordNet is a net. So the important part is the graph. Um, and I should have escaped my underbars. But um, we can say, tell me all the things that a dog is. And it says a dog is a canine, is a carnivore, is a placental mammal as opposed to a marsupial, is a mammal, is a vertebrate, is a chordate, is an animal, is an organism, and so forth. This is very useful in generalizing. One of the problems, again, in natural language processing is the sparseness of the data. It turns out that in 30 years of the Wall Street Journal, they never say stocks skyrocket. Um, although stocks go up and down all the time. But if we can say that skyrocketing is a kind of rising, um, we can generalize from things we've seen before um, to understand them. As we did this work, um, I teach at NTU where I teach um, linguistics and semantics. We use this in our own research to see how different languages express things in different ways. And it turns out one of the big differences between languages is in whether you use a pronoun or not. So uh, we were looking at Sherlock Holmes short stories. We have an English sentence which says, um, he shot her and then himself, I think. Uh, and the Japanese translation had shot then, because Japanese doesn't use pronouns. Um, the Chinese translation had husband shot wife then self. No, I think the Japanese also had self. So whether you use a pronoun, whether you use nothing, whether you use a common noun that refers to that, we wanted to investigate more. So we added pronouns to WordNet. Um, again, different languages do things in different ways. So classifiers, uh, quantifiers we wanted to put in. It turns out many of the words we use in actual text don't have referential meaning. So we can say of a dog, I can define dog and there's a set of things that in the world that are dogs. But if I say, wow, there's nothing in the world that I'm referring to. But it's still a useful word. So we've been adding in um, exclamatives, greetings, um, checkmate, tally-ho, all of these um, weird words. Um, modal auxiliaries, and now bound morphemes. We're fairly predictive, uh, um, um, productive in language use. So I can say I am unlaptopped and therefore unhappy. Um, 
But if I look in uh, the dictionary, laptop won't be a verb, and unlaptop definitely won't be a verb. But all of you understood what I meant, I hope. Um, so we can say un takes something and says I'm lacking it. We can convert nouns into verbs and do other things. Of course, we have 30 languages or 150 automatically built languages, but there's 6,000 languages in the world. So we're still very much pushing to add more languages. Um, new languages coming soon, spoiler alert. Um, um, Gaelic, um, Mongolian, um, German is actually going to be freed, which is important because they're a very big word net. Um, and what was the other one? Not Bulgarian, Romanian, Latvian, Lithuanian, one of the Baltics, Estonian. Um, so we're gradually increasing um, our coverage of the world's languages. And up until now, I've glossed over some of the details. Everything has been linked through English. Everyone generally has one person in their project who speaks English. But it turns out that there are many concepts that English just doesn't have. Um, so again, in Southeast Asia, pretty much every language makes the distinction between raw rice and cooked rice. Um, in Japanese, gohan and kome. Um, in Indonesian, nasi and the other one, which I always forget. Um, so, but if we have them in English, we just don't have these concepts. So we're building a new interlingual index. We um, uh, talked about it at a conference in January. It should go live in a couple of months, um, where we can add um, a shared index for um, concepts, whether they're in one language or any language, that will allow us to make things much more rich for all of the languages. We want to do better disam automatic disambiguation for these languages. Sometimes we want to break words into bits. So everybody really means every person. Um, it's, we use one word, but we can think of it as two. Um, and of course, more, more languages. OK, I'll finish there. Pretty much right on time. Um, does anyone have any questions or large amounts of lexical data you want to leap up and give me? Um, yeah? Uh, how do you decide when where a language begins and where it ends? For example, I noticed you used uh, the term Bahasa um, to, to combine uh, Malay, Malay and Indonesian. And I know it was back that they're probably about you know, quite different from the There was quite a lot of confusion between the languages. They're, they're similar enough to be very confusing. So, so Malay would probably be about 8% of Indonesian. And Indonesian is all the concepts that are completely foreign to Malaysia. So how do you sort of form sets and supersets of the history of the stone around it? Um, so opportunistically, is I think. So we try to um, start with data sets we have. So Ultimately, in the Bahasa thing, we would like to further differentiate between varieties of Malay spoken in Sarawak. In, even in Indonesia, there, there's quite a lot of variation as you go um, further east. Um, and we are aware that we're binning things that are really um, continuous. So it's not the fact that everyone in Malaysia speaks the same and everyone in Indonesia speaks the same, but we start off with things that are generally recognized, so standard Malay and standard Indonesian. As we get more data about smaller dialects, we will also add that in. And ultimately, we hope to combine it with corpus data. So it's almost certainly not the case that there, well, there are probably some words that are only used in one country and not used in the other. But what's more likely is this word is used 80% more often in Malaysia than in Indonesia, for example. And we'd, we'd prefer to model things like this. And we um, are trying to do the same thing for English, where currently we have very ad hoc marking of things. But there are words that are used more in Australian English than British English than American English and so forth. And then the question of what we can combine is finally depends on who's building it. 
So we could probably put Serbian and Croatian in the same dictionary, but we don't because they, the Serbian WordNet group and the Croatian WordNet group don't want to. Um, we could do the same for Czech and Slovak, um, but again, we don't. On the other hand, we have Mandarin Chinese, and Mandarin Chinese probably has as much variety in it as um, uh, standard Indonesian, I would think. So, um, uh, summarizing, I think we, we, first of all, we're restricted by the data we have, so we make distinctions we can. We, the distinctions are hierarchical, so we can say this word is Indonesian, this is in Javanese Indonesian, this is in something Indonesian, and ultimately we hope to um, not just use categories, but go to a slightly fuzzier distribution across the dialects or languages. Anyone else? Any more questions from Francis? No, I'll be here all day, so if you have questions, you can catch me afterwards. Thank you.